So, Joanna, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about Coil Perspectives and then, and then ask you some questions. Uh, we do this as a way to gain, to gain insights uh, from experts in the field. And, uh, of course, you're an expert in several domains. But in this capacity, I'm asking you as an expert, as a faculty member, as a mm -hmm. teacher. Mm -hmm. And um, well, we ask the same questions a, a, across a, a variety of um, uh, visitors in order to get different perspectives. So we yeah. call this quail perspectives. And this year, we're focusing around the question of um, what inhibits student learning in your, in, okay. from your experience? The idea being if we have a, a better handle on what, why students might not be learning in various kinds of classes, maybe we can begin to think, which will be my second question, uh, about innovation solutions to, to help reduce that barrier. Yeah. And I ask that one in the form of without limitations of time and resources, we, which we know is not yeah. reality, but what the heck. The third question then is, um, given that, is there a single first step that we might take yeah. toward a solution to helping our students learn more in our class? Yeah. So let's start with the first one, if you wouldn't mind. What, in your mind, as you're working with your students, what are the things that maybe inhibit them from learning in your classes? Uh, well, those barriers uh, are, vary among people, and they also vary among the different modes of course delivery. Right? right? So in a face-to-face -face class, um, I've had the experience where maybe a, a more passive student um, might not be as vocal. So if there's an activity where the instructor is, uh, wants the students to verbalize and synthesize different content and be able to apply it to their experience, um, that student might miss out on that activity because now they're not getting the feedback from the instructor, they're not getting it from their peers. But that barrier wouldn't be the same in an online class because they're forced to participate. They're more in more of an anonymous setting, so um, they, that personality doesn't have that have that problem. Um, so, on the flip side, um, in an online class, uh, I've had the experience where, um, you know, I, I have one course where there's a lot of writing, uh, a lot of participation that's required, and I was giving them. Um, a lot of feedback and I would give it to them in the course management system where you're supposed to and and based on some of the comments I realized that some of the students weren't getting my feedback so uh, I decided I was not going to use the uh, the specific grading tool I was going to email everybody and I emailed them the same type of feedback I would have that I, in the tool and I also asked them a question I wanted them to write back to me um, they didn't have to, but it was more just, just to see if, the, mm -hmm. if I would get more of a response. And I did. I got more questions than I have ever gotten, ever, in an online class. So I took it one step further, and the students that were uh, struggling a little bit, I asked them if they wanted a phone call. So I had um, a couple of them say, yeah, sure, we'll mm -hmm. schedule a phone call. And I talked to one of them. And this person told me, um, you know, after we talked about how to be successful in the course and what she could do to um, prioritize different tasks and what was most important, I said, well, how's it going for you? How, how do you like the system? How do you like the, the course? Because, we, you know, we always like feedback on the design. I just wanted to see what she'd say. She says, you know, I can't find the course reserves. She goes, so every week I spend so much time looking for the papers. And, and I just, and she didn't want to ask me, but I had to ask her for that. And so I said, well, are you in front of a computer? Let's walk through it. So I showed her where it was. Simple fix, right? Another guy, I asked him, um, you know, how's it going after all the, you know, discussion about the course? How's it going? He's like, well, you know what? Now that you mention it, the 9 o'clock deadline on Sunday night is an issue for me. Everybody, I'm in California, and everyone else gets till midnight. Oh. I can't submit my stuff by 9 o'clock. I'm like, no problem. I changed it to Monday morning, 3 o'clock in the morning, and I didn't tell anybody else. You know, so the students still, so I felt like it was still even sure. playing ground. Um, but those were two simple barriers mm. that I was able to fix. And, but it was based on a more of a transformational leadership mm -hmm. style, mm -hmm. where I was trying to find, give some individual consideration to each person to figure out what they needed. And those people needed something real easy. You know, and I, I think that um, if, if we try to find ways to personalize the online environment to be similar to a resident as much as we can, mm -hmm. um, we would eliminate some of those easy things that are, you know, they're not focusing on the content because they're looking for right. um, course material or, you know, the, the other person is feeling rushed. I mean, you mm -hmm. know, these 
So it's, you know, some yeah. things are very simple. So I, I like the idea of personalization yeah. and, and the fact that um, these strategies are addressing individual barriers. So mm -hmm. you're defining a time frame for one student might be a barrier, another one might be navigating the system. Right. Um, so in your idea, is there a way to create an environment where we, and I love the fact that you're reaching out and asking them, mm -hmm. and, and maybe these students are thinking, wow, yeah. this faculty member actually cares about me and wants to know, yeah. you know, what, what, what my issues are. And as you say, they, they may not even have thought about that until you ask. Right. So now that's that right. you ask, that's kind of interesting. Right. Um, is there a way, if you had time and resources, yeah. what could we do to sort of create an environment where we'd learn that, in, that information from students and then be able to address it more effectively? Um, I think that one thing that we could do is to and I think you're already doing some of it. You're disseminating these best practices. And I, I think, you know, it's great to focus on the automation and the tools and the technology mm -hmm. and all that great stuff. I mean, I love it too. I'm an engineer. Uh, but I think there's also a way to really help the faculty find out what works for everybody. You know, that simple fix that I found, the email, um, you know, maybe we can automate that. I don't know. Um, but that's something that I found out that I'm sharing. And I would like to hear other best practices. And I think that, that your group is already doing that um, by doing this perspective type of thing. Sure. And I also think another thing that Penn State does a great job at is the instructional designers. They hire a fabulous group of instructional designers. And I think that the faculty needs to pay more attention to um, the, that resource and take their advice. And when you know, they, they have a good ideas on how to implement and how to, um, to implement that material online, because we're always trying to convert the resident into an online course. That's where we start. And um, it doesn't always, it's not that smooth usually. Uh, so those, to take advantage of that resource and keep investing in those instructional design designers and the design uh, tools um, would really be helpful as well. So, so for the last question is uh, of that uh, set of uh, recommendations, do you have sort of a single best step? So I'm going to give you two that I think I heard you say, and I'm, I'm going to force yeah. you to kind of maybe okay. pick one or the other. So the, the first thing I heard, which I like your point about, especially since you're a systems engineer, who we might expect a technical answer to, yeah. you gave a very personal answer. You right. said reaching out and, and connecting with the students and asking yeah. them, what, what's your barrier? What can right. I do? That, that's a human thing. That's right. not a technical thing. Um, that was one. And the second one you just finished which, with, which was to reach out to the instructional design community yes. and engage them in how can I improve my course? What can I do? So if, if you had to pick one that might be more effective, maybe it's too hard to ask you to prioritize. I, mean, I think we need those. to do both. Yeah, you know, we yeah. really need to do both, and I, um, I, I think we need to really think about, you know, the, the human factor mm -hmm. is even in engineering projects. That's what usually is the failure point. Mm -hmm. It's not that the engineers don't know the technology and don't know how to program with something or design something. It's usually the personal, the communication part of it, the human part of it that is. It, causes the failure. If you look at why most projects fail, and I mean by fail I mean that they take too long, sure. they didn't have the requirements, they, you know, Over all budget. that stuff. Yep. Yep. Um, it's because of the communication in the beginning. So, um, and that's what I was trying to do. I was trying to be, make it a more easy way for those students to communicate with me because some of them don't want to email me and say, where are the course reserves? Mm -hmm. You know, like I, just th simple things like that. Yeah. They're not going to complain about the time. And, but those simple things, and it's just I found yeah. out by communicating, is, is how I fix yeah. those barriers. I love that solution. Yeah, <laughs> good. Joanna, thank you so thank much you. for joining us. It's always a pleasure to see you. Great. Thank you. Thank you.